We're going to start a little early, if that's right. But if you want to stand up and join us in worship, happy nearly Independence Day. <laughs> Would you sing with us? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the Son. Oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All shall come with trumpet sound oh, oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone for blessed to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand. Sing this next song with us. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust. Trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me. Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender. Savior, I surrender all. Sing this 
last verse out. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. skies for amber waves of gray for purple mountain majesties dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears America America God shed his grace on seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. And, uh, you know, before I get going with some announcements, it's someone's birthday today. <laughs> it's Mr. Will's birthday here behind the keyboard. So uh, thank you. Your lovely wife reminded me about that and said, if I wanted to embarrass you, I could. So I did. Well, her birthday was two days ago. So oh. <laughs> Right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
yeah. and their anniversary. So wow, we like and to they do had all at once. Just get it out of the way. Yeah, and their second daughter was born a couple weeks ago. So you guys have a lot all in uh, one spot there. It's great. Uh, this past week, we had a, a great experience here with a uh, esports camp run by Slingshot Sports, and here's some pictures. I think you can see a little collage I put up there, just so you could get a sense of how we transformed this room into a, a gaming experience. And I was not expecting this to happen, but the person who ran the camp is actually here today. Uh, Brendan O'Brien, would you come forward? Just, I didn't mean to embarrass you, but people need to know your face. <laughs> so Brendan, would you just give, uh, uh, this is totally ad lib here, so. Would you just share a couple things about how well this camp went from your perspective? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for hosting our event. It's churches like this who see the vision of being able to reach the gaming community for Christ. It's huge. So without your partnership, we would not have been able to do anything this past week. As far as I'm concerned, it was an awesome week. It was great. The kids had a blast. In fact, yesterday I was reading their reviews, and out of one out of six, it was six, six, six. There was a five, and then there was a six. Um, and the parents also had a great uh, experience as well. One of the things that the parents really liked about it was our ability to be able to talk to the kids about not only how gaming skills transfer to life skills, but also the balance that's required to not only game, but then to also as they say, touch grass, right? Go out and touch grass. So it was a great experience. One of our gamers is right here. He did a great job, it was a lot of fun. So thank you for letting us be a part of your community and Lord willing, more events will bring more people and then we, more people hear about Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And so some of the things that happen in, in camp aren't necessarily planned, but one of the dads whose son was involved with the camp, I've known him for a while through sports. He was sharing some heavy stuff with me about his kids. So like there was good relational real life stuff happening here in the camp. And so, you know, you guys are all a part of that. Your offerings help make the, this stuff happen. So it's something we want to keep doing and, uh, Brendan and I are kindred spirits in how we think. <laughs> we're like, well, let's do this. So we're going to be debriefing some more. I have some ideas, and I'm sure Brendan has more. So I just want to thank you guys. Even though you weren't here, you were a part of that through your prayers and through the, your giving. So uh, thank you. Uh, just to keep you abreast of some dates, just to remind you, our baptism picnic was rescheduled for August 21st. And I know, I know that seemed like a disappointment. It seemed like a bummer. But this, because we rescheduled this, this gives uh, other people more opportunity to participate. So Lord willing, we're going to have more people baptized because of changing the state than we initially intended. So that's a little bit of the rationale behind that. Uh, ladies, you got a, a swim thing coming up uh, July 13th. So I know we're going to be getting that information to you, but just please keep that date open. I think that's open to kids as well. Yes? All right. So that sounds like a good thing, a play date kind of there as well. And just to remind you again about our giving, we have several opportunities for you to give, not only here in person, out at the worship center or information center, but through texting, and that number's there in front of you, as well as online. I know a lot of you do the online reoccurring giving, so thank you for that, no matter how you give. Uh, we appreciate your generosity, and it's a blessing to us, and it's a blessing to God. Uh, so after my prayer, I'm going to have David Gundrum come up. If you don't know who David Gundrum is, that name is not familiar uh, to you. David Gundrum is the director of Church Extension, which is the church planning arm of the Bible Fellowship Church. He is my supervisor. So if you have any dirt or complaints you want to direct to human resources, uh, David is your guy. And, and I would welcome that. I'm not afraid. I'm trying, always trying to improve. But uh, David and I have known each other like forever, right? Like we first met at Lancaster Bible College back in 2000 when I was a freshman there and much younger and no gray hair and probably thinner. So 
But we've had a good relationship, and David does a phenomenal job keeping all things running in church extension. So we're, we're grateful for him, and he's going to be sharing God's word uh, for us this morning. But before we do that, let's bow our heads as we continue worship through prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, weekend in our country as we anticipate celebrating our freedom as a nation, the freedom uh, we enjoy as the United States of America. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of so many who secured that freedom but also continue to maintain that freedom. It's also an opportunity for us to, to worship you and thank you for the freedom we enjoy in Jesus Christ through his person and work on the cross. We thank you, Lord, because of his sacrifice, not only are we freed from the penalty of sin, we're also freed from the power of sin, and one day we will be freed from the presence of sin when Jesus returns and we enjoy life in the new heaven and the new earth where there's no crying, there's no pain, there's no disease. Lord, we long for that day, but until that day comes, we thank you that we can look forward to have that day with great hope, no matter how dark things seem around us. We remember that uh, our hope is in Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, and his light shines in and through us. So I pray, Lord, as a result of being here today, that we would cherish that light even more. We would cherish our freedom in Christ, and Lord, that we would not abuse that freedom that we enjoy in Christ as the Apostle Paul exhorted the Galatian church. Lord, that in Christ we are free, but we are not free to just live as we please. That we have that joyful obligation uh, to live a life of sacrificial service to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray, Lord, as a result of being here today, that we would be encouraged and challenged to do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we give you praise for the work of Church Extension and its director, David Gundrum. Lord, I know often um, he, he enjoys the, the successes of what you do in Church Extension, but along with that, there are burdens, there are challenges, and he carries those with him daily. Sustain him and strengthen him by your power. May he remember Jesus' invitation to come to him, all who are weary and la heavy laden, and he will give us rest. Lord, may, may David experience that rest in his soul today and even throughout this week. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing here and what happened this past week. It wasn't a lot of numbers, but there were nine kids whose, whose lives were affected, who, who not only got to en enjoy gaming with one another, but, Lord, they had solid conversations about their value in the eyes of God they learned about uh, Jesus and his good news. And I thank you for that opportunity, and I thank you for Slingshot and Brendan's leadership there. Encourage our brother that this ministry is worth it, that at times when you're doing something new, it's hard. But I pray, Lord, that you would encourage his heart uh, to keep pushing forward and, and to use this with churches that want to partner with him. Lord, there's a great opportunity here for us to connect with kids right where they are, and also with their, their parents as well. So may you bless Slingshot Sports and, and Brendan as he leads that endeavor. Lord, we, we don't want to forget about um, our opportunity to give back to you. I know many of us probably have already done that online or we brought our offering here. Lord, I pray that as we heard this news this morning about how this Slingshot Sports Camp really made a difference, that we would be encouraged and that we'd really sense that we're part of something special. We're part of, of your kingdom work right here in the Easton area. And I pray, Lord, that we will co continue to give faithfully and generously. And so may you bless the offerings that have been given and will be given yet today, that they would be used to help expand the powerful work of your kingdom here in the Easton area. And now may your spirit be upon our brother David as he shares your word. I pray that your spirit uh, would do a great work in our hearts and our minds as we, we sit here and hear the voice of Jesus, Jesus, our shepherd, speaking to us through your shepherd, David Gundrum. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. David, you have the floor, and you can step up there. You can just go that way.
Well, okay. So David has a, an outline that I put on our digital sermon notes. So if you're on our app. Uh, oh, yeah, those are back there. Sorry, don't mind our little intramural discussion here. Those are on the information center. They're out there front and center. Okay. All right. I will get them. Do you hear me now? There you go. There you go. Great. Good to be with you this morning. I was with you not too long ago. I think um, last year sometime. So that's not too far away. But good to be with you this morning. And Brendan, good to see you. Brendan, for years, helped us out with the church plan over in South Allentown there at Lighthouse. And we're so thankful for that. And good to see you again. And good to see this ministry that you have and what's going on with it. Praise God for that. Uh, Tim's passing out some uh, information on church extension, which I wanted you to have. I wanted you to see uh, your Bible Fellowship Church planting missionaries. And these men are missionaries. They are reaching people with the gospel and seeking to gather them together and build up a church, a Bible Fellowship Church. And you'll see there that they extend from Mer to actually Tapachula, Mexico, which is the southernmost part of Mexico, on through, and I don't think Emer is listed in there in that one yet. His name is Emer Molina. He's our church planter in Tapachula. Just last month at our board meeting, we officially opened a Bible Fellowship Church Mission Church in Tapachula. So Emer is there meeting with about 30, 35 people and uh, seeking to grow that church and, and bring it into the Bible Fellowship Church. He's actually under the supervision of Marcos Ramirez, who is our director of church planting in Mexico. Marcos is the pastor of the Bible Fellowship Church's first international church in Merida, Mexico. And Marcos really has a, a mindset of multiplication, uh, planting daughter churches. He has planted a daughter church in Via Magna, Mexico, just outside of Merida. And now he's overseeing the work down in Tapachula, and he also has an idea for one in Pablo Segunda, which is another environ of the Merida city there. And so Marcus is doing a great job, and um, what a great brother. Uh, met him a number of years ago, and from that point on, we started working toward that church that he planted and pastored in Merida, becoming a Bible Fellowship Church. So they are now, and he's doing a wonderful job of uh, expanding the Bible Fellowship Church and the Kingdom of God there in the Yucatan Peninsula and now down in Chiapas, uh, the state of Chiapas in Tapachula. Uh, <clears throat> when you come north, you start to come into Florida, and uh, that's where we have a church plant in Naples, Florida. Uh, Brother Filbert, uh, Jason Filbert, is church planting there. And then we hop, skip, and jump all the way up to Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and um, we're, just, we're, we're just working really hard to expand the kingdom and also expand the Bible Fellowship Church. So please, pray for these men. They really do need your prayers. Uh, them and their families, just like Tim and Tori here, uh, come face to face with all the challenges of starting something from scratch, starting something that isn't in existence, and having the faith and the power of God to help them bring it into existence. So that's what they do. Church planning, I think, is the most difficult ministry in the kingdom. And so just pray for them. Uh, if you see one of those individuals that you really take an attraction to because of where they're located or something, uh, go to our website. I think it's listed on the back of that. Go to our website, and you can find out more information about any of those individuals that are listed there. Well, today is one of those holidays, like Memorial Day, where we think of um, our freedom, and we think of so many individuals that have given their lives, that have sacrificed uh, to give us freedom and also maintain that freedom. And that's what our focus is going to be about today, sacrifice, sacrifice. So turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2 this morning. <clears throat> Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies 
of God to present your bodies a living and holy spiritual sacrifice of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for the Bible that gives us not only explanation and clarification on all of life and worship, but also then moves on to give us indication that you want us to do something about what we've learned. In other words, Lord, you want us to be in action by what we have been impressed with in God's Word. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, Lord. We're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture that is now in this position of following up so much explanation and clarification in the first 11 chapters to now giving us the understanding that you want us to be in action and you want us to put who we are into action. So bless us with our time this morning, Lord, and we pray your blessings on everyone's lives here, Lord. I don't know their spiritual condition, Lord, only you do. And I do pray that uh, for Christians who are here this morning, that they would be edified and even convicted, Lord, to the point where they would really would anal analyze their life as to whether or not they are living, holy, acceptable sacrifice in your sight. And for those who are here this morning and may not be a Christian, may not be born again, uh, this is not something foreign that they won't be able to understand, but they really won't be able to comprehend it, Lord, without explanation that we'll give a little bit later on, Father. And I just pray that those who may not be Christian, uh, be a follower of Christ this morning, would really be convicted by your Holy Spirit to see the great sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross, that they could be then called to your family and be a child of God. So bless our time this morning, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, I think it was Thomas Edison. Uh, I, I didn't exactly, I, I know this phraseology, this little uh, phrase that I'm going to say to you, was from an inventor, and I think it was Thomas Edison, uh, that said, enlightenment is followed by implementation. Now, what he was saying there is that when we are enlightened, when we gain some new information or some insights or something, we just shouldn't let it sit in our minds and roll around there but actually we should put it into action. So when looking at the writings of the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul wrote, it depends what, what uh, camp you're in, whether he wrote 13 books of the New Testament or he wrote Hebrews making it 14 books of the New Testament. In all his writings, Paul, commentators kind of rob from grammar and say Paul loves to be indicative followed by imperative. And what we mean by that is that He'll give clarification, he'll give explanation, and then he'll follow it, that's indicative, and then he'll follow it with exhortation and direction to put what he taught us and clarified for us and explained to us into action, that's imperative. And a great example of that indicative approach to writing followed by imperative approach is given to us in the book of Romans here. The first 11 chapters here, Paul tells us about the condition of humanity that is depraved. It's totally depraved. In Romans chapter 3, he tells us that there's none righteous, no, not one. And then he goes on to say that all fall short of the glory of God. But he doesn't leave us hang with that. He goes on to explain what God did about that predicament for humankind. And he tells us that God uh, provided Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross to, first of all, redeem us, to buy us back, from sin and, and bought, buy us back with his precious blood uh, to reconcile us, to bring peace between God and ourselves in reconciliation, uh, and also to justify us, to take away the guilt based upon Jesus Christ being our guilt taker on that cross. So Paul goes on through these first 11 chapters of Romans and clarifies and explains for us our, our condition before God our need for salvation, and how that salvation is applied to us through the great sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary in bringing us free from condemnation 
and making us a child of his. So what we have in these first 11 chapters is that indicative approach to Paul's writing. Then comes a doxology at the end of chapter 11 there that you see if you're looking at chapter 12. Just go up a couple verses and you'll see this doxology in verses 33 through 36. And how appropriate. After telling us that we're sinners, but telling us that God has a plan to save us from our sin and and redeem us, reconcile us, justify us, sanctify us, no wonder he broke out in doxology. And doxology is just singing praise to God for who he is and what he's done. So you have that doxology at the end of chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. He could have easily stopped his letter right there, but he doesn't. Because he wants to go on and give us some imperative action that follows this enlightenment of the great salvation that Christ gave us on the cross. And immediately he goes into chapter 12 and the first verse, even the first word there, therefore, therefore, not only connecting us back to the immediate context in the chapter before, but rather to the whole first 11 chapters, therefore refers to. So this morning we want to look at this great understanding of Christ's sacrifice as the basis, the motivation for us to manifest a holy, pure sacrifice in our life and to be transformed into this living, holy, acceptable sacrifice that God wants us to be based upon the great sacrifice we received from Jesus on the cross. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at those three aspects. First of all, what motivates us to be sacrificial? It's motivated by mercy. Look at chapter one, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now, many of us have seen, if not all of us, have seen individuals that have demonstrated mercies towards somebody. And in many cases, when somebody demonstrates mercy toward another person, that individual will then be motivated to show mercy to someone else. Uh, One of my favorite novels is Victor Hugo's uh, novel, uh, Les Miserables. I love the book. I love the Broadway show. We went to see it a couple times. I love the music. I love everything about Les Miserables. And uh, the key character, the protagonist there, is Jean Valjean. Now, Jean Valjean is a criminal, and a criminal who was let out of prison, escaped from prison, actually, and he ends up being sheltered by a priest. And to pay the priest back, he steals the silver uh, vestments and things like that that were in the, in the chapel, and he takes off with them. He's caught by some police and brought back so that the priest can identify the stolen merchandise, and they can take him to court. Well, they bring him back to the priest, and instead of the priest verifying that he had stolen these items, the priest said, oh, no, I gave him those items. They were a blessing for me to him. From that point on, that grace that was shown, that mercy that was shown to Valjean, from that point on, Valjean vowed to live his life in a sacrificial, merciful way to help others. Well, What we have here in chapter 12, verse 1, like I said, is the follow-up to the first 11 chapters telling us of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ for you and I who are born again. And this great sacrifice that reconciled us, redeemed us, justified us, and sanctified us. We have received these mercies. And take note that the mercies here are plural. Therefore, I urge you, and that word, urge, is a dramatic, dramatic, meaningful word here. It's something that tells us we have to do this. Paul is saying you have to show mercy because of the mercies you have been shown. And so a person who has shown mercy, especially the mercies shown to us in salvation, Christ's great sacrifice, we are now commanded to sacrifice, to move out and work it out. And Paul writes later in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Work out your salvation with fear and what? Trembling, okay? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying work to get your salvation. 
with fear and trembling, but work out what you have graciously been given. This great sacrifice of Christ has given you salvation. Now work it out. And Paul here tells, goes on to tell us how we manifest that in our lives. So we're motivated by the mercies of Christ on the cross to be sacrificial, to serve God as sacrificial servants on him. If you look at the second part of verse 1, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So in response to what God did for us in Christ on the cross, we really owe him everything. Paul says literally here, work it out and be a living. This is the way we manifest our, 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 our thanksgiving to God for these mercies. We manifest being a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. In some translations, it says reasonable service. There's that word there for either reasonable or spiritual, depending on your uh, translation, is the word logikos. Now, when you hear that word logikos, what, what English word does it remind you of? Logical, yeah. It's only logical, Paul says. It's only reasonable to respond to this great sacrifice that Christ has given to you. It's logical that we who are born again, been redeemed, been reconciled, been justified, been sanctified, given eternal life, uh, are heirs to God and children of God. It's only logical, it's only reasonable that we respond in a sacrificial way. And Paul talks about three ways that we manifest this sacrifice in our own life. He says we are to be a living sacrifice. Our lives are to live out Christ's sacrifice through us, being merciful and being a guide to others to come to Jesus. He also goes on and says, be a holy sacrifice. And so that's, that's easy to understand. He wants us to be pure as Christ was pure. See, it was Christ's purity, sinlessness, that went to the cross. We couldn't go to the cross. We can't sacrifice for ourselves. We're too dirty. We're too sinful. It had to be a sinless Savior, one who could go to the cross and do away with that wrath of God toward us, but also replace it with the love of God and the mercy of God in us. And so Paul says here, be a living sacrifice. Live out this sacrificial act that was done for you by being a sacrificial actor in this world and also be a holy sacrifice, a pure sacrifice, a life that is different than what we see around us. And finally, be an acceptable sacrifice. Well, what does that mean? It means that a life that God welcomes into his presence and says, well done an acceptable sacrifice. Now, yeah, let's ask ourselves the question here. We, you know, we are to manifest our thankfulness for the mercies that God has extended to us by being, being a living, a life-giving sacrifice to others, by being holy and pure sacrifice, a testimony of the goodness and, and the perfections of Christ, and also being an acceptable sacrifice that we today if we were called into God's presence, would we be acceptable? Would he say, well done to us? Yeah. You see, our service to God is manifested through a pure life, one that has, giving a, uh, has this giving a mercy effect on others. This is the goal of the Christian life, to live in sacrificial service, to live every, to live every aspect of our life in adoration for what God has done for us. So Paul wraps up these 11 chapters by saying, therefore, by these mercies, I urge you, I command you now to respond to this sacrifice you've been given by being a sacrifice yourself, one that is, one that is living, one that is giving life to others by your testimony, one that is pure, one that people can look at and say, now that person's different. They're living differently than most people that I see and one that is acceptable to God, realizing always 
that we must face the Lord. And we need to be acceptable to him. Now, that, acceptable, that acceptance uh, to him, that acceptance by him and living for him and being pure and so forth uh, needs to be demonstrated. It needs to be a continuous action of ours. And that's where we come to verse 2 there. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God and is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, in verse 2, there's definitely a change in the verb tenses here. And it changes to present active tense. And it's, it's settled in those two little words, uh, two letters each. Do not be conformed, okay, and be transformed. So what Paul is trying to say here is that in order to be this living, pure, acceptable sacrifice in response to Christ's sacrifice for us, we need to not be conformed, and we need to be transformed. And the action there tells us that this isn't something that's done overnight. It's not something that's once and done, not being conformed and being transformed. It's something of a continuous action that goes on in our life. We continue to work at not being conformed, and we continue to work at being transformed. Now, all of you have set goals in your life at some point or another. Uh, you know, we set goals. We spell out what we want to achieve and everything. But that's not enough, is it? Setting the goal isn't enough. But rather, you have to act on that goal, don't you, to achieve it. You have to move out and do what is necessary to reach that goal. Where Paul, you know, Paul here understands the goal of the Christian life. The goal should be for us that we would be a living pure, acceptable sacrifice. But he doesn't leave us hanging. He goes on in verse 2 here to give us the marching orders for how that happens, how we are a living, pure, acceptable sacrifice. And it's wrapped up in these two very active verbs. Do not, first the negative, okay, first the negative. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. That's a negative. Hate to start out with negatives. Uh, it's better than ending up with negatives. We're going to end up with a positive. But there's a negative here. And, you know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, the Bible's just full of do's and don'ts. Well, let's clarify something first before we get into this don't here, okay? Don't be conformed to this world, all right? God is not acting dictatorial when he tells us something to do and something not to do, okay? What he's acting is gracious. He is extending his grace to us when he tells us not to do something or not to be something. He's acting graciously toward us. He, he's our father. And just like a parent, when they tell a child, don't do this, hopefully they're telling them for the child's good. And the same way with our Father in heaven. When he says, don't do this, he's not telling us because he wants to exercise the, his authority, although he has authority. Not because he wants to exercise authority, but rather because he wants to do what he says later here, conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. He wants the best for us. And so he, like a good father, like a good, perfect, heavenly father, would tell us, don't do some things. Don't do certain things that are going to harm you, that are going to make you less than who you are in Jesus Christ. And we don't like to be told what not to do. Sometimes we don't like to be told what to do either. But in this particular case, Paul starts out with this negative. Don't be conformed to this world. Now, that same idea of world is given to us in, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, where he tells us that the God of this world small g, the devil. God has given the devil authority over this world for whatever reason he holds to himself. But he's given the devil limited but some authority over the world we live in, this cosmos, the mind thinking of this cosmos, uh, the, the mores of this cosmos, and everything else that goes with this world. Don't be conformed to the cosmos. Don't be conformed to the world that is being controlled by the devil. 
but rather be transformed. Now, see, when he says be trans, well, before I move on, I want to ask us a question, okay? And the question is this. As a Christian, ask yourself this question. As a Christian, am I being conformed to this world? Am I yielding more to the mores, the thinking of this world than I am, as we're going to see here, the world of Jesus Christ? the eternal world, the eternal life. You know, I, 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 when I was thinking about this, I was thinking how sensitive I was when I was first born again to the negative things of this world, the mores, the morals, and uh, the dirt and everything else. How when God saved me, I, oh, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want to think like that anymore. I don't want to I don't, want, I don't want to be part of that anymore and so forth. I remember I had a stack of these big, what are they, 78 albums or something like that. Had a big stack of these albums, you know, and uh, Led Zeppelin and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I was so sensitive to this stuff, you know, that, that I took him and ditched him out, you know. And uh, wouldn't go, wouldn't even walk past a bar room, you know, and so forth. Uh, that was 37 years ago. You know, there's a tendency to lose that sensitivity towards the things of the world. And there's a tendency for that stuff to creep back in. Now, I haven't gone out and bought any vinyls or anything, you know, new vinyls and stuff. But there's that sensitivity that we have when we're born again. We realize, these, as Jonathan Edwards says, we realize God gives us these new tastes, these new, these new understandings of things. And we look at things through the lens of the Bible and through the lens of the Holy Spirit, and we say, I don't want any more of that. It's not for me. I'm a new creature in Christ. All things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm new. I'm new. But as years go by, you know, we kind of look and we say, what happened to those sensitivities? Where did they go? I'm dabbling in this. I'm dabbling in that. I'm walking in kind of a crooked path, so forth, not as straight as it used to be. But the question for us is, uh, are we conforming? Only you can answer that before the Lord in your own life. See, the idea is, is now this second, this, this, this complementary response here that Paul gives. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. You're a new creation in Christ. Be transformed. And it is a complimentary response here. And what it's to show us is that this is a continual thing, that continual battle that we have. Now, this continual battle in the life of the Christian, the, the world wanting us to conform, God wanting us to be transformed. And we go, we go through life, and you might say, why didn't he take us out of here when we were first saved? Why didn't he just transform us right away when we got saved and shoot us right up into heaven? It wasn't God's plan. God's plan was to keep us in the world, but not to be of the world. God's plan was to keep us here, to be his living, pure, acceptable testimony of sacrifice to the world that his children might be saved through us. And so, you know, transformation is this continual fight that we have. We fight off conforming and put on transforming. And note, this is done where? It's done through, not through action, not through becoming religious, not through serving in the church or anything like that. But take notice what Paul says. Do be, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Not your actions, not where you go to where you don't go, but by your mind. Now, that should tell us some hints of how transformation takes place. How are we transformed to be a living, pure, acceptable sacrifice to God? How are we transformed? This isn't brain surgery, brethren. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, and how is our mind transformed? Same way Peter said, that we grow in the grace and the knowledge 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where do we get that from? It's not arbitrary. We get it from prayer. We are, we are transformed through this communication line we have with God. We talk to him. God, make me more like Jesus. God, take away this temptation I have. God, keep me away from that. I don't want to be... I don't want to be conformed to that anymore. I want to be transformed. God, help me. We pray without ceasing because Paul knew it was a constant battle. We read God's Word. We study God's Word. We, we, we imbibe God's Word. We meditate on God's Word so that His thoughts are going in here and not the thoughts of the world. So when the thoughts of the world, when the devil wants to bring the thoughts of the world into our mind, we have God's thoughts saying, no, 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 no. No, nope, no, nope. not going to conform there. I want to be transformed by what God wants me to be. And this battle, this fight will go on in your Christian life and my Christian life until, until we die or the Lord returns and takes us with him. It is constant. Even the Apostle Paul back here in Romans, Romans 7, he talks about this struggle, this fight that he has with not conforming and transforming. He says, wretched man that I am, I want to do the things I want to do, but I don't do the things I want to do. I do the things completely opposite. Who will set me free? And then he concludes by, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, sets me free. See? So another question. First question was regard to the negative here. Who am I yielding to? Am I yielding to this world and its thinking and mores and culture and morals? Or am I yielding to Jesus Christ, his word, and what he tells me to do? How are we being transformed, transformed into a living, holy, pure, acceptable sacrifice for Jesus Christ? It's our reasonable thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> you know, think of that. If Christ did this for me, shed his perfect blood on the cross of Calvary, what's my reasonable response? To be a living, pure, holy, acceptable testimony for Jesus Christ. And he just doesn't leave us with that goal, but he gives us the way to be that. He gives us this wonderful time we can have with God in prayer every day, every moment, without ceasing. This wonderful Bible that is his word, that puts his thoughts. In. I've been reading Proverbs the last week at night. Wow, you talk about conviction. You know, I read that about every six months. I get back to reading through the Proverbs, and it just wakes me up again. Wait a second, man, you drifted here. You drifted there. You drifted there. You know, and I come back. Because of prayer and God's word, God, bring me back. You know, bring me back in my thinking, my actions, Lord. So, how are we doing with that? How are you doing with that? You know, how are you doing with reaching the goal of being a living, pure, holy, acceptable sacrifice by not being conformed to this world, but being transformed through the renewing of your mind the Bible and prayer. We all, most of us know who John Bunyan is. We know him because he wrote that wonderful uh, Pilgrim's Progress uh, story for us. But he wrote something else, too. He wrote another um, document called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, speaking about himself. Let me read a portion of his testimony from that. It says, I remember that one day as I was traveling into the country and musing on the wickedness of and blasphemy of my heart. Now, how many here, raise your hand, how many of here walk through a beautiful country setting and think about the blasphemy and the wickedness of your heart? Raise your hands. Okay, I, well, you don't, okay. But here's, here's Bunyan, okay? He's walking through this beautiful, you know, beautiful countryside, and he's musing, meaning he's really thinking about this wickedness and blasphemy in his heart. And he goes on and says, and considering the enmity that was in me to God, that scripture came in mind, he hath, quote, made peace through the blood of his cross, end quote, Colossians 1.20.
by which I was made to see both again and again that day that God and my soul were friends by this blood. Yea, I saw that the justice of God and my sinful soul could embrace and kiss each other through Christ's blood. This was a good day to me. I hope I shall never forget it. How many of those days do we have where we muse on the wickedness, the blasphemy, the hatred we had in our heart and how the blood of Christ cleanses us from all ungodliness? And it doesn't stop there. Once we come to that point where we say, thank you, Lord, for cleansing me and saving me, we move on. And then we live for him. Will you remember the cross and all that God has done for you to the point of sacrificially serving him with all your heart, soul, and mind? And will you be a living and holy testimony of his grace? Be transformed in his word and fill your mind with the greatness of the cross that Jesus died for you. Now, Christian, we're going to end here. But for us who are born again, we're Christians. We repented of our sin. We came to know Christ as our Savior. And we have been given all that is in salvation to us. We've been redeemed. Our, the price we owe God is that paid. It's done for. We've been reconciled. There's no, there's no hatred now between God and us. That's been taken care of. Uh, we've been justified. We're no longer guilty. We don't have to look over his shoulder and wonder, oh boy, if the Lord comes again, where am I going to be with him? We don't have to worry about that. To them that are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation. We've been sanctified. We've been set apart, a saint unto God. We are all these, all these things. We are all these things. And the question remains, am I living for him because of what he sacrificed to give me all those things am i now living sacrificially for him so christian i want you to think about that we're going to go in a quiet moment of prayer i want you to think about that and analyze i'm going to think about that too i'm going to think about that you know am i transforming or conforming am i a living holy pure sacrifice acceptable to god but some of you may not be a Christian. You may not be born again. And what I've had to say here, yeah, you probably got some flowery thoughts about what I had to say this morning and everything, and it sounded good, and, oh, that guy's pretty articulate and stuff like that. But this is for you. If you're not a Christian, if you're not born again, you haven't repented of your sin, and come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. You are being conformed to this world. And when that time comes to leave this world, you will stand before a God who will not accept you, but rather will reject you. So if you're in that position, as we take a moment of quietness and prayer, just meditating for a couple minutes, I want you to think and ask yourself the question, who am I conforming to if I'm not being transformed? If you see your need for Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, cry out to Jesus. Repent in the next quiet moment. Ask God to forgive you. Receive Jesus Christ and be born again and transformed into a new creation. Let's quiet our hearts and go before the Lord. Just take a few moments of quiet meditation as a Christian thinking about where I stand. Am I more conforming or transforming? As a non-Christian, you're not transforming. You're conformed to this world. So think about that. And the only way out is through Jesus Christ.
Father, for the Christian, it's most difficult to live in this world. But we do have victory because the Holy Spirit indwells us because of what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary to give us victory and change us. Lord, I pray for all of us who are Christians here this morning as we struggle with being a living, pure, holy, acceptable sacrifice in response to what Christ did for us, that we struggle. Some of the old ways seem to haunt us, and sometimes we're prone to wander. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Give us the faith that's necessary to see Jesus walking with us and the Holy Spirit empowering us. The Word of God filling our mind and prayer always there to cry out to God for help. And for that one who's here this morning and may not be born again, not a Christian, their destiny is doomed. They are under condemnation. They will face the Lord without Jesus Christ, and it will be a very, very significant time for them, Lord. I pray for that one or more who are here this morning that need to be forgiven, repent, and have Jesus in their heart. I pray that they would do that even today. So thank you, Lord, for this time we have uh, to meditate on these things, the great position we are in as Christians, and the great need some are in because they're not. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to close out our time uh, with partaking of the Lord's Supper. We do this here the first Sunday of each month. And I imagine that tomorrow at your 4th of July celebrations, food is going to be a big part of that, right? As we celebrate our freedom. Well, food is a big part of celebrating the freedom that we have in, in Jesus Christ. He commanded that we partake of this meal until he returns. And so if you are a part of Jesus' family, you've repented of your sins and you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we welcome you to participate. You need not be a member here at, at Forks Community Church. But if you're, if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we would just ask you to refrain. That's a warning from Scripture, uh, from 1 Corinthians 11. So we just encourage you, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus, that you would remember the freedom that you have in Christ. It's because of his his broken body, which is represented uh, by the bread and his shed blood, that we are redeemed and we enjoy that, that freedom uh, from sin. Uh, because David led us in that time of prayerful reflection, we normally do that during communion. I think uh, that, that satisfied that, that important part of communion of really reflecting on our lives. Uh, let, let's take and eat and drink this morning to our spiritual nourishment. So let's Hold in our hands, we hold the symbol of Jesus' body uh, that was broken for us. Jesus is the bread of heaven who came down uh, to give us life. So let's take and eat this together. hold in our hands the cup which is the symbol of Jesus blood shed for us it's that blood that redeemed us that cleansed us from all unrighteousness so let's take and drink this together first Peter refers to our salvation as tasting of the goodness of God he's quoting Psalm 34 there and we're going to close out a song that about the goodness of God. As believers in the Lord Jesus, we simply don't know that God is good. We sense his goodness in our lives because of the presence of his Holy Spirit, whom we receive when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So let's stand and close out the service with this last song, The Goodness of God.